Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Jim Grisanzio from the Oracle Groundbreakers team, and I'm back here for a really special guest today, an interview with Simarjeet Singh. I met Simarjeet um, in December of last year, 2019, at Sangam 19, which is uh, Oracle developer, uh, oh, actually it's an Oracle user group uh, conference uh, in, uh, in India. It was a beautiful conference. It was massive, it was big, it was a lot of fun, and Simarjeet was the keynote speaker. So, Simraji, welcome. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me back again. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation post the keynote. You know, when, <laughs> when you come off stage and you're full of that energy and that's when we have the conversation. That's some of the conversations that I really love because uh, no matter how well you prepare, there is always something that is left unsaid at the end of something like that. And that interview that, that I had with you was an opportunity to say those things which per, perhaps, you know, were left out. So, it's a pleasure to be back. Back again, we were speaking about the VUCA world, and that was sort of the subject of the keynote in Hyderabad. VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And we were speaking more from a um, disruption point of view, right? Technical disruption. And no yeah. one saw what, no one saw <laughs> coronavirus coming. No one saw COVID-19 coming. No one imagined 60% of the world's airplanes would be sitting on the ground for the next so many months, and the whole world as we know it would change, you know. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it, it was. It, it's been amazing because I mean, I've 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 been wanting to follow up with you for a, a you know, for a couple of specific reasons. Um, one of the reasons is is because you and I met physically right mm. at the dividing line between old world and new world. Right. That's, that's right. That's right. The second mm -hmm. thing is I wanted to follow up with you because I attended your keynote. I was very impressed with it. I was very impressed with you and, and a couple of reasons why. Not only with how you sort of you captivated the audience and how you managed that whole you know, process and the information you delivered it was a lot of fun as well. But after the keynote, you and I had a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. An interview. I saw you walking the hallways, talking to people. And then I just assumed you would disappear, right? Mm. No, no, that's not me. That's but, not me. Exactly. Mm. So, so this mm. is later on, many, many hours later on, we're having dinner and there you are at dinner. This is like nine, nine hours later. Okay. Right. Right. And I said to myself, said, wait a minute here, you know, keynote speakers come and go cause they're special and stuff. So you and I had actually had a, a nice conversation at dinner as well. And uh, mm -hmm. so I was very, very impressed with that. Uh, there are other Thank keynote you. speakers who do that, but um, it is not actually as common as you think. And I appreciate uh, that Jim. So that's why I wanted to hook up with you here now. Um, under normal circumstances, okay, with, with sort of a more normal world that we remember from the past um, mm -hmm. in technology and you know, the people that are watching us now are you know, software developers and you know, database administrators. They're, they are, you know, are you know, technologists of one flavor or another. Mm -hmm. In their world, their world changes all the time just Rapidly. as a normal state of affairs, right? Yeah. Um, so they're used to that, you know, they're used to learning new tools and having to grow um, because the industry changes so rapidly. Not all industries change as rapidly as, you know, high tech, right. really uh, software. Mm -hmm. Now we find ourselves in a whole new paradigm. Right? True. Now we find ourselves where the world underneath us has changed in, in a very, very significant way. Whether you like it or not, it's happened to you, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's what I want to talk about here. I want to talk about not only how you deal with change and grow so you can, you know, thrive in this new world without getting eaten up, um, mm. but how do you deal with it when it's really out of your control? So first, let's start off with how have you adapted? Uh, thank you. No, it's interesting you mentioned about, you know, staying behind after the keynote and mingling with people. I, I believe an opportunity to be on stage in front of a thousand people is a golden opportunity, not only to inspire people, to shake people out of their, perhaps their uh, comfortable 
so thinking, but also to make a connection, to make a real human connection. So one of the major challenges uh, that when, when you specifically talk about professional speakers like myself is that uh, missing out on that human connection, right? And we were so um, reliant on being there in person that uh, this whole, when the COVID-19 thing happened, so you had to reimagine sort of how the entire thing um, worked. Now, thankfully for us, we were thinking about putting in a YouTube studio because YouTube, as I mentioned earlier, was happening side by side, parallel to my speaking engagements. And what I would enjoy doing was that post a speaking engagement, there would be thoughts that I, that were left unsaid. There were other things that I wanted to add on, or I wanted to share the same thing in the local language in Hindi or Punjabi, another language for the masses, which I probably spoke about in English. So I'd come back to my office and just to manage my peaks and valleys. It's really important because when you're, when you're on stage in front of a thousand people, yeah, your energy's at peak, your ideas are at peak, you're all fired up, and then it sort of slowly fades away because, hey, and you gotta look for the next challenge. So typically it would be until the next speaking engagement came around that I would be in that same state of mind once again. But um, I found a way around that long back and that was videos. Let's continue because I believe as a speaker, as an influencer, my first job is uh, to connect the dots and to create content that inspires, you know, and that in itself is a powerful way of marketing. So we don't spend a lot of time in our office, you know, thinking about clever ways to market ourselves. We say, how can we serve? How can we add value to our networks? And that sort of brings on that uh, the connect remains. Uh, so it's important two or three things here. Number one, to not lose in touch, uh, not lose touch with your strengths. And for, for as a speaker, as a, um, uh, as a influencer, one of my first jobs is to make observations of daily life and present them to people in a way that they can relate to it and they can look at things in a different way. So uh, when COVID-19 happened, and I think it was, I attended a large conference after the one in Hyderabad, after Sangam, and that was in New Delhi, uh, and that was a branding conference, and uh, 350 people all across the world. And this was around the um, 22nd of February, and that's when coronavirus had just started coming into India. I came back home four days later, and I heard, started hearing the news. I was like really worried, okay, you know, because I met people from all across the globe, and but then now, thankfully nothing happened and then the government announced the major national lockdown. So we didn't see it coming, you know, in, in terms of that this is going to be such an aggressive response to this thing. So I feel, Jim, if we look at this magnifying glass, wherever we focus our energy, whatever we focus on, it becomes bigger. We human beings, by virtue of concentrating our energy, of our creative imagination, we can hedge a big truth when we decide, okay, this is the direction I'm going to focus on. So once, as soon as we accept this has happened, this is a new reality. There's nothing I can do to change, to change this. And fear is not an option. Once you got to remind yourself, fear is not an option because when I invite fear in, I make uh, wrong choices. Look at what happened in many countries across the world where people were fighting in supermarket aisles over toilet paper, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, if you, it, that's nothing else but our primal instinct of fear. I mean, look at the priorities of people fighting over toilet paper or over everything else. And that just says how, how grossly wrong we can be when we allow fear to be the predominant emotion. So I think it was a conscious decision not to overwhelm myself with sort of the negative information that was coming in to avoid to sort of control the intake of news, social media inputs, and because fear spreads. It's yeah. contagious. It's contagious. And then people add their own little bit in, you know, we project our own fears onto the world. And by the time you realize it's snowballed into something really big, um, far bigger than what it actually is. Now, I'm not saying people don't should not take precautions or, you know, other sort of things that the governments across the world have been talking about. But at the same time, do not allow this fear to overwhelm your system. So that was a conscious choice. And then to take it, you know, during that time, say, OK, let's take it one day at a time. What can I do today to add maximum value to my tribe? You know, so we have about 12, 12 uh, 1 million plus people uh, on YouTube, uh, another 200,000 on Facebook, et cetera. Th there's a tribe of people mm -hmm. who have, who want to hear from me. 
you know, who, who look up to me and my words could soothe, could inspire, could shift, you know, and I felt, I took it as a sense of responsibility that this is the time, um, I don't know who said this, but there's a wonderful leadership quote, which goes something like this. Um, the true strength of a captain is tested not in calm waters, but in storms. Um, so everyone can be a good captain in, in calm waters, but it's it's when a storm hits, it's do you show up or not, number one. <laughs> uh, and what sort of a mindset do you show up with? And then what value are you adding? So we said, okay, let's take it one day at a time. What can we do today to add maximum value to our, social, to our tribe, to our online tribe? Uh, what can we do today to make sure that things are on track for what we're doing? And how can we focus on our circle of influence? And Dr. Stephen Covey, he gave this this beautiful model in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said you could divide your worries into two categories, things that you're concerned about and you can't control them, right? You have no control over them whatsoever, but you can, if you choose to, spend your entire day worrying about the outcomes of those things, but you have zero control over them. Right. The, he said these things are your circle of concern. And in the middle of the circle of concern is a small, tiny circle that's your circle of influence. These are things that you control on a daily basis. What sort of an attitude do you wake up with in the morning, right? Um, what, what are your priorities at the moment? Um, how uh, well are you going to, uh, where are you going to spend your time? Where are you going to focus on? These are choices that we get to make. There, there's a wonderful book, Jim, that I must recommend to everyone who's listening or watching. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. Dr. Viktor Frankl profoundly changed my life. Holocaust survivor, this gentleman was a psychiatrist and two years he was in the Nazi prison camps and he observed human behavior under the most extreme circumstances ever. And he wrote this beautifully, the book is wonderful. Um, and he, he said a couple of lines which have stayed with me ever since. He said, one of the last human freedoms is the freedom to choose your attitude under any given circumstances one of the last human freedoms. He said, regardless of the circumstances, we always have the choice what, to cho what attitude do we choose? And that sort of, I believe, um, Jim, is sort of the foundation of everything else. What do you achieve in a given day? If you're in a leadership position, how are you impacting other people? Um, you know, if, you're, if you have a family that's looking up to you for guidance and support and inspiration at this point in moment, uh, what are you giving to them? So it's really important uh, to take care of yourselves during this time. So that's one of the first things. I prioritize that. Before that, it was it was for granted, you know. Simarjeet Singh is is there, okay. We gotta take care of the other things. We gotta take care of the of the keynotes, of the slides, of everything else, everything, but you know, okay, he's here, you know. But then COVID-19, the great um, leveler, you know, yeah, it, it, yeah put that's, everybody on the, yeah, it doesn't that, distinguish. That's a really good way of putting it. It certainly has flattened out a lot of a lot of industries and a lot of um, ways of looking at things. Like for instance, um, I mean, I noticed that you are a very strong personality. You're very assertive. You're very bold, and um, you know other other people aren't necessarily so strong, so bold. But with the flattening out. Of, of everything is more equal now, I guess, right? We all have access, you know, in this field anyway, all have access to this, you know, sort of uh, technology. But tell me about some, some of your thoughts about how people who aren't necessarily used to change or who may be a little bit more shy or not as bold as someone like yourself. I mean, you're very grand, you're strong, you're bold. You get up there and you- hey, That's how I appear to be from the outside. <laughs> I'm pretty much well, just like everyone else on the well, inside. Okay, but right. you see, but you see somebody like for instance with engineers and software developers or community, you know, software, you know, people in the, in the tech business, many of them are noticeably internal. They're noticeably internally focused. They're not as out there. They may mm -hmm. be very powerful individually when they write software with the right. advanced tools and they form these communities and they contribute code, but their personalities, a lot of them are shy. A lot of them are geeks. Mm -hmm. They're inwardly mm -hmm. focused, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and nothing wrong with that. Some of the most creative people on this, on this planet are people who are either ambiverts or introverts. They retreat into their shell every now and then, come up with great ideas, and that's how they function best. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, sorry, right. go on. Mm. No, just any, any thoughts about are those 
types of people from your experience, um, do they have to do other things to get themselves out to be able to embrace this situation? They're a little more, they're a little more vulnerable than the rest of us because uh, perhaps they at times tend to keep a lot of stuff to themselves, which I don't think is healthy, especially given especially these circumstances when there's a lot happening. So I do believe that, um, you know, um, technology does run the world. Technology is an enabler. Technology is empowering you and me to have this conversation continents apart right now and many more to listen, to tune into it later on, but also to understand that um, human beings run the world and human beings create the technology and we're still here, although artificial intelligence is fast catching up, but we're still here and that human connection is, is one of our top psychological needs. I would recommend everyone to spend some time, about 15 minutes to watch Tony Robbins speak on the six human needs and Jim he talks about he simplifies psychological needs into very simple things six very simple requirements number one is certainty you know we all want a little bit of certainty from our life you know if I bought a new house and it's going to be still standing there two years from now or if I've worked um, a couple of months in a new company that I would get paid at the end of it you remove certainty from a human being's life and we got to you know we sort of shake up the entire world of an individual number two is variety um, that we crave for uh, different things. We, that's hence adventure, hence travel, hence so many other things. So these contradictory needs are there. These are two of the basic requirements. But at the same time, there is growth. There's a need for growth. Mm -hmm. There is a need for contribution that research proves that we feel really good about ourselves when we brighten up someone else's day, right? Um, and so it's growth, it's contribution, it's connection and love, another top human psychological requirement. Hence, um, the need for family, social connection, or even pets or gardening or plants or whatever it happens to be. And finally, the need for significance that uh, my existence makes a difference to the world. So if, if you look at these six needs, many of them been compromised due to the lockdown and other situations across the world. You know, so many of us have lost the certainty about our jobs and our businesses and so many other things. Variety is gone, adventure is gone, travel is gone, dining out is gone. But at the same time, uh, we must understand that this is how, these are the foundation forces of how the mind these are six things and many more, but this, the list is not exhaustive, but these th six things have a major impact on how we are feeling in a given day. So introvert or extrovert or ambivert, we've got to understand and spend time with ourselves and find out, uh, it's just like problem solving, go a few layers deep. If you're feeling um, nervous or if you're feeling irritated or if you're feeling sad or depressed to go at the root cause what is happening in my environment or what is happening around me or what's happening in a given day that has brought me to this feeling because everything on the surface just might be a trigger and the root cause might be a few layers deep so it helps to spend time in meditation for everyone extrovert or introvert. And I'm not talking about chanting. I'm not talking about any particular mantras or any particular techniques. I'm talking about sitting calmly, reflecting on your life and trying to um, just learn from your mistakes and trying to um, discover the triggers which put you into that mood and trying to the six human needs exercise, for example, to understand if I felt good on a given day, what happened? Did I have a conversation with someone? The other person wasn't feeling so good and I lifted that individual. And as a result, I felt better about myself. Let me do a bit more of that. Let me just reach out to my LinkedIn connections or do something of that sort or organize a Zoom call or something. Uh, if variety is missing, if dining out is missing, if travel is missing, if adventure is missing, could I maybe, I tried this during the lockdown, uh, more uh, house plants across in the office and everywhere. And it gives me great joy uh, to switch off and move from the screen every now and then um, to water the plants and to do something. It's like they add life to the concrete. So you've got to think of creative ways um, to figure out and to fill in and to heal yourself and to fill in the gaps of what might be missing in your life at the moment. And that applies to everyone. I think self-reflection is the key. Self-reflection is the key. As you rightly said, different human beings with different temperaments, different ways of looking at the world. Some of us have spent a lot of time building our mindset up in a positive way. Some of us probably did not get that time ever in the, in the race of making things happen. So now is your time, but self-reflection is the key. I mean, no one can tell you what's best for you, but when you begin to spend time with yourselves and sort of ask yourselves the right question, um, you get the right answers. And that's really important uh, to figure out what might be working for me might not work 
for another individual, but it's important that you ask yourselves the right question. For example, the question, what's going to become of me? What's going to become of the world in six months time is a scary question. Wrong question. Wrong question. Open-ended. Yeah, yeah. open-ended and uh, primarily focused on things which uh, you can't control. control. What's going to become of the world in six months? No one can tell. Right, not even the best statistician, best astrologer, cannot predict what's going to happen. How am I going to go the next week? What are the sort of things I want to do to brighten up my day? Or you know, I call it morning decisions. This is one thing I would highly recommend to everyone: spend thirty minutes with yourself, fifteen, five, ten. Put on your favorite piece of music, meditate, run, jog, do whatever you can. Um, morning decisions. Visualize yourself. How are you overcoming the sort of usual challenges that show up in your given day? Visualize yourself overcoming those challenges in a creative way. Decide, I'm going to have a good day today, right? When you, when you go to a stand-up comedy, right, Jim, and you can probably relate with this, uh, you've sort of made up your mind, I'm going to have a good laugh today. Is that a yes or no? Do you agree yeah. with that, right? You, you don't go there as a critic. Okay, I'm going to critique what this guy is talking about and say, hey, that's not so funny, right? And because everybody else is laughing, you join in it's contagious and everybody ends up having a good time right and one of the things where we participated in that exercise was we went in with a positive expectation with a mindset hey it's stand-up comedy and you know I'm, I'm gonna laugh and have a good time if we incorporate that same mindset in a given day say okay here's another here's another opportunity here's another day and the reason why I focus on the day aspect every now and then again quote unquote the day is because a day is a reflection of your life a day is a microcosm of your life how you're spending your days is how you're spending your life by and large and if you want to make changes in how you're spending your life you've got to make changes in how you spend your days right so work on the day brighten it up and as a result you will see the results will overflow into the other aspects of your life a couple of things you said there i want to follow up on you um <clears throat> especially because i think they're really applicable to you know people in software communities you mentioned contribution a little bit earlier um you know, when I did my interviews at these conferences, one of the, you know, when we were live, um, one of the things I always ask people, ask developers is, you know, what do you, what's your understanding of a community, of a software development community or a user group community or a, or a database community? Mm-hmm. And they always answer, and I don't mind that the answer is always the same because I just want to hear it. It's always expressed a little bit differently, but the core is the same. The fact that they can contribute. Right. right. So somebody right. within the community, they really, it makes them feel special that they can contribute, whether that's source code, engineering talent, yeah, bug fix, uh, mm-hmm. advice, conversation, mm-hmm. uh, mentoring, mentoring, mm-hmm. photographs, right. you know, like I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, of they, course. I still have them, by the way. Wonderful photographs. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that's, that's one of my contributions because, mm-hmm. you know, I like it, you know, and it's something I can do. And, and, mm-hmm. and so believe me, you don't want me writing your you know, code for your you know, system. <laughs> um, but but if just the fact that you're recalling all that right now is a sort of shifting how you're feeling, right? And you're feeling right. good about recalling all those moments. And that's right. the power of contribution. That's the power. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. And, and so people in software communities, they express the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I ask them over and over and over and over again, is the power of being able to contribute to community because then they get something out. They get something out of the community. And it's a self-referral, you know, self-referral process. Um, the, true, second, true. the second thing I wanted to focus on is focus, the ability to focus. Mm-hmm. You had the magnifying mm-hmm. glass earlier. Yeah. To yeah. me, I mean, I, I've, this is a this is a struggle in many things. So in many senses, um, you know, to get because the mind is designed to think, right? It's going to be thinking all, all over the place, that. yeah, right. everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it's the essence of being able to relax and to transcend your your current circumstances to be able to mm-hmm. focus. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit more about focus because, like, for instance, a developer, um, they when they write <clears> code, you know, when they write code, they their goal many times is to get very deeply into concentration. Right. Okay. Because you mm-hmm. can't solve really hard, hard technical problems 
on the surface flitting about here with the TV on and the phone ringing and on social media, you can't right. hold that way. You got to, got to settle down. You got to get more mm-hmm. deep. To mm-hmm. me, to me, that sounds like the process of, 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 of your meditation. Right. It is indeed. Yeah, it is. It is yeah. a form of mm-hmm. meditation. It's a form mm-hmm. of it's got cutting everything else yeah, right. and focusing on. Yeah, right. I agree. So, mm-hmm. so talk a little bit about your experience in focus. Uh, it's it's vital for me, um, especially Jim, when I'm pouring my heart into a new project. Let's say it's a new video series or a new keynote or something um, that I too need to focus, not necessarily to come up with new stuff, but to sort of look at existing stuff in a in a fresh way and to connect the dots in a, a nice new way. It's because I enjoy the process, you know, more than the results itself. So, um, and the day I stop doing that is the state, day I will stop loving this profession because more than being on stage or being on camera or impacting someone else's life. For me, the the joy also lies in um, creating something and putting the dots together, whether it's storytelling or humor or um, an activity which will help people have that aha moment. So focus for me involves number one step that I use personally is uh, to remove the clutter. It's really, really important to remove the clutter in every which way. Physical clutter, mental clutter, spiritual clutter, yeah. And so once you've decluttered, now you're in sort of a minimalistic sort of space. And uh, the the books behind me, by the way, are uh, for um, what Jack Canfield calls uh, shelf esteem. Uh, <laughs> I haven't read all of them, right? They just they, it makes the office look nice. Give it that feel. But even, even with your reading preferences or your watching preferences, you can't take on everything. And in a world which is hyper-connected with social media, you've got to actively take charge of this process and remove the clutter, which might involve, uh, for me, it does involve putting my phone on an airplane mode for many hours at a stretch. And um, I would usually sit down with uh, to organize the flow of my keynotes with a big, huge chart paper on the floor and sort of map it out. This is what I would like to talk to the audience in the middle this is my beginning this is my story and this is etc so that um, I'm deeply immersed into it and what happens is um, as a result the outcome that happens rather than skimming on the surface is very different so two or three things number one is we've, we've got to invest enough time that you that sort of the neurons start firing together in that direction and you go to the next level. So what happens is if you spend 30 minutes in a task and then all of a sudden you're interrupted with a phone call or a tweet or something else, you've lost the hard work that you put in the 30 minutes and now you're back again. So I would say remove clutter during that period of time. And, and even if you don't feel like even on the days that you don't feel like sit down and start doing what needs to be done. And very soon you will see the state of flow takes over this beautiful book by professor Mihai Csikszentmihalyi uh, flow, where he talks about, you know, organizing our mental energy. And um, another, another very important piece of research I must share here is uh, coming from uh, professor um, Jeremy at Harvard university, who said uh, you're more likely to act yourself into feeling then you are to feel yourself into action. Right. And I think that's worth repeating. You're more likely to act yourself into feeling, but a lot of people are waiting for the feeling to come first. Let right. me feel focused and I'll act focused. Right. It works the other way. Let me begin to focus and I will feel focused. Uh, of course, a little caffeine helps. Of course, um, a little exercise helps and those sort of things they add on. But, um, So coming back to it, number one is make sure that the hard work that you put into um, getting into that zone, um, getting into the state of flow is not interrupted uh, by something which is trivial or irrelevant. Organize your day in that way. Uh, number, Number two is start doing what needs to be done. You know, and I think for my videos or writing the scripts for my videos or any, everything else that is vital, very important, super important to me, I follow the same principle. Let's get into it. And I think five or 10 mi- minutes later, so I warm up and then we get into that state of flow and then things begin to really speed up. A lot of people, they switch before that. So that's that's not the mistake you should uh, do in, uh, in, in terms of focus. Number three, I think it's really important to take breaks take good breaks, yeah. rest if you must, but don't you quit. If I may, Jim, I'd like to read this poem out, which has been a source of inspiration for me. Uh, the Don't Quit poem by John Greenleaf here. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, 
when the funds are low and the debts are high. And you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is strange with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure comes about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you can never tell just how close you are. It may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when you are hardest hit. It's when things go wrong that you must not quit. And what I, what I really love in this entire poem is rest if you must, but don't you quit. Yeah. Don't underestimate the power of taking a break or spending some time in nature or a good night's sleep. The good night's sleep is the most powerful reset button on this entire planet. It is shocking, yeah. shocking mm -hmm. what eight or 10 hours will do <laughs> to change uh, your state. Completely, completely. You probably even forgotten. What was I mad about yesterday? Yes, <laughs> you, you, yes. you have to start all over again, right? So, <laughs> yeah. One of the things um, as you offer this sort of advice and, and these um you know, perspectives, um, <clears throat> people should know that you've gone through many changes yourself. And one mm -hmm. of the things that, um, so a lot of this is, is your own personal experience. It um, is. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about you because when I met you in India, um, you said that you had like this major career change. And I was watching one of your other videos recently where mm -hmm. you said, yeah, no, I think you were in the restaurant business or mm -hmm. hospitality business. And then you that's started, right. Yeah. And then you, and then you moved into this and good no, memory, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> no experience, no clients, mm -hmm. yeah. nothing. So mm -hmm. that's a pretty, um, you know, that that's, that's hard to hard to do. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, what, what made you decide to number one, make the change and number two, you just jumped? You just, in, in, I mean, there was no net, right? There's no net. There's no net. And th that's the beauty of it. That, that's, that's what makes it very exciting. And that's what makes it very challenging. And um, it, it, perhaps if I have, would have had a net, I probably wouldn't have jumped or I would have spent more time thinking about it. And this is, this is for everyone who's listening right now. Um, some of the problems cannot be solved by thinking about them. You've, got to take that next step. You've, even if there's huge amount of uncertainty, huge amount of fear, um, you've got to take the next, next step just to see how it's going to work out, just to see how it's going to fall into place in the entire uh, scheme of things and to not be afraid of fear, uh, sorry, afraid of uh, failure or to not be afraid of embarrassment because um, that's part of the learning process and not to take any setbacks personally. It's just like a little child exploring to see how far I can push the boundaries. And if you look at it, the education system is designed to teach us out of that. We were all born with that sort of innovative um, DNA to explore and do silly things. And that's how we oh, ask irrelevant questions. What adults think are irrelevant questions are, are the, is exactly the process how a child learns about the world. And somehow we're taught out of that. We're conditioned out of that. We're told it's not, you know, people are not going to take you seriously if you continue thinking like that. But I disagree. We've got to keep that spark alive. We've got to um, it, continue this journey of risk taking. Uh, and that's how we push the boundaries of our individual lives. And that's how um, I am doing what I'm doing. Of course, the first part, uh, which was in 2007, 2008, when I left the, the hospitality business, as you already know, and I moved back to India, that was the first part. And as, as, I, as I reflect back now, February 2020 is going to be the second next major push which we, you know, the first one we did it willingly. The second one was thrust upon us, but it's the old Indian story goes, Jim, I don't know if I shared it in the keynote um, at Sangam or not. Um, and a rich old man announced a competition, you know, so daughters of royalty would get married this way. And the most, the strongest, the wisest man would win a competition. And then the king would say, okay, you're fit enough to marry my daughter. And that's how things operated in ancient India. So you probably might've heard the story. So this, this old rich man in ancient India announced a competition. He said the, the uh, man who wins it, the young man who would win this competition would not only get my daughter's hand in marriage, but also 50% of all my wealth, I would sign it to 
to his name on the spot, which was a pretty good offer, right, Jim? Um, yeah, would, yeah, people would show up. Married folks would show up. Let me try, as Simonjit's been talking about, move outside the comfort zone. So as, as he anticipated, a crowd of thousands gathered around a huge pool, huge pool of water, and he said, the first young man to jump in from this side and emerge alive from the other side is going to be the winner. <laughs> and there was a catch. The pool was full of alligators, right? And as soon as he's announced this, he heard a loud splash. Someone's jumped in already and the whole crowd is cheering him on. Yes, you can do it. And this guy's swimming with all his might and he's making his way through the alligators unhurt, surprisingly, not a scratch emerges from the other side. The old man runs up to him to welcome him to the family, he says, son-in-law, welcome. He says, sir, hold it right there. I don't even like your daughter. I don't want your money. Right at this point of time, I want to find out who pushed me into the swimming pool. <laughs> and we've all been pushed. Students across the world have been pushed. Yeah. Teachers yeah. have been pushed. So all of business entrepreneurs and 2020 Feb as a keynote speaker, I had to change on my description on LinkedIn from keynote, international keynote speaker to virtual keynote speaker, right? And that's the sort of transition. Very proudly, I would carry this bag with me, Jim. This was my carry on bag uh, with major airlines across the world with the platinum tag, you know, proudly displayed as a frequent flyer. The interesting part is I don't use this bag anymore and the airline doesn't exist anymore. That's how <laughs> Jet Air has gone out of business. Finish. Oh, yeah. That's how much the world has changed. So what do you do? It's a, it's a, it's not only a fight for survival, but it, it started off as a fight for survival, but then evolved into finding out, wow, this is wonderful. Dr. Wayne Dyer, he said it beautifully, Jim. He said, uh, when you change the way you look at things, the things you're looking at begin to change. When you change the way you look at things, the things you're looking at begin to change. So once we did our first virtual keynote, which was using a regular uh, built-in camera on the laptop, which was you know not equal to the quality that you're seeing right now, but I had an aha moment. I said, look, I don't need to travel anymore. I could do this remotely sitting where I am right now, spend more time building up content and doing the other sort of things that we could not do the last eight years just because I was traveling so extensively. So once I made that shift in how we process it, uh, I think the famous Greek philosopher Seneca, he said it, uh, events don't have any meaning on their own. No event has its uh, meaning on its own. We give them meaning, mm. right? So. It depends upon that meaning, how are you going to, what are you going to make of that event? So I, I changed, I said, look, this is an opportunity to spread out and we've done more interviews, more podcast interviews, more YouTube videos, more virtual conferences, more video messages. We sent out, uh, we put out a post on LinkedIn saying, if you've been one of our clients and we've had more than 300 over the last uh, 13 years, and if you would like a customized five minute inspirational video message for you, we would film it in high quality and send it to you free of cost. That's what we told 300 plus of our existing clients. And so many wrote back, say, hey, you know, could you do, write about, talk about this and talk about that? And every day we were filming seven or eight short video messages without charging our clients a single penny to say, hey, we are here for you. You were there for us the last 13 years. Uh, you gave me work the last 13 years. And now that your teams are suddenly finding, trying to find the feet, uh, the ground beneath, beneath their feet, I am here for you, right? In whatever way I can. So that sort of kept us busy. It's really really important um, to figure out creative ways to channelize your energy positively. So even we had when virtual um, sort of conferences were not coming in, just the early days of the lockdowns, we utilized our time doing that. So this is the next big shift. And gradually we've evolved, you know, we said, okay, let's bring a new DSLR. You, you were very helpful. Thank you, Jim, for all your suggestions on how to improve the video quality. I saw your live stream how to improve the audio quality. We're still working on it, how to use uh, different software so we can put in presentations and videos on the screen while I'm right. speaking to people. It's been a nice learning curve. And I'll tell you something, every little piece of progress that we've made uh, it, the, the excitement of a little child. So that evening, I'd be, <laughs> me and the team would be really excited. Woohoo! You know, the lighting looks better. The sound looks better. We can now present uh, using a green screen or we can now present videos, etc. And uh, that brings me to another very important aspect of human nature. We are driven by progress. We love progress. Tony Robbins, six human needs. Growth is one of them, right? So do something every day, which improves the quality of what you're doing so that you feel good about it. It's not to impress the boss. It's not to to, you know, you're not doing it for someone else. 
you're doing it for yourself. And every little improvement that you make is going to sort of in some way raise your self-esteem about who you are as an individual, what choices you are making as an individual. It's not about someone else. So we kept on doing that. I live about a five minutes walk away from my office. I'm in my office right now. And every morning during the last, I think it's seven months of the lockdown, haven't traveled anywhere. I would still wear, uh, I wear formals when I present on stage. So I would still dress up in the morning, wear my formals. Yeah. And go to office. So it, many people. <laughs> that's that's so important. You know, Thank you. I, I I see some of these people on these on live, you know, on you know, on the video, and mm-hmm. they look like they just walked out of bed. Come on. Come right. On. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, because the mind is trained, it understands. Yeah. So th- this perfume right here, the Turdy Hermes, I'm not marketing, <laughs> I'm not advertising it, but it's been my on stage uh, before I go on stage. So it's been my anchor. You know, in NLP, they talk about anchors. You know, right. smell is a powerful anchor. It can take you back in time and music is a powerful anchor. And uh, for the last 13 years, every time I would go on stage, I would have this perfume on. So what do I do now during this difficult seven months? Every morning I put this perfume on just to make sure that my mind is trained to right. give the very best, right? So it's really important during this time to look after yourself and to do the very best you can and then call it a day, you know, and don't, don't not to carry on anything during the night and not worry about too much uh, about things that you cannot control. Just do the best you can every given day. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. when you and I met, we were in Hyderabad, right? For, mm-hmm. the, Sangam, for the Sangam conference. Um, so are you from Hyderabad? You mentioned the UK, I think, or... No. So where are you now? Uh, I am in Jalandhar in Punjab, which is far away from all the metro cities, oh, okay. uh, far away from all the high-tech companies. Um, Punjab is uh, known for agriculture. Uh, Jalandhar is a tier two city in India. So I'm not in a metro. And that's another interesting story. Whenever whenever I speak to youngsters here or anywhere across the world, location has now become irrelevant. You know, with this whole digital thing, location is irrelevant. Skills and what value you can add. And um, that's going to um, create a new sort of um, uh, order in terms of whatever services you're providing. So it's largely as long as we have a good Wi-Fi, a good high speed Internet connection right. is really irrelevant wherever you are. And I think it's a blessing in disguise. Um, many years, everybody would say, OK, why don't you move to a bigger city? Things life would be a lot easier. But since uh, we have roots in the area and sort of I like it here, it's not overcrowded. It's closer to nature. And there's a beautiful view from the office. Uh, yeah, let, let's see if we can show you that. Let me turn the camera around a little bit here at the side. Uh, okay, it's very bright right now, but you can see that's all those. I know you can't see, but it's all the trees over there. Ah, there, there we you go. go. Yep. Yep. There green. we go. Yep. Yeah, green, completely green. And that's one of the best things I like about being here. So, um, and also the fact that very little traffic, small city, I get to spend time on what I really want to do. So again, decluttering, decluttering. This was a conscious decision, yeah. Cool, very little traffic. I've, I mean, I've been to India many times and very little traffic is not a concept that I've ever experienced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we were on, I was um, on the Yatra tour, you know, the Oracle Groundbreakers Yatra tour, but again, with the Indian community, Indian uh, community that we have there, it's a, it's a, lot, it's a very, very big community. Um, it's great. We went to six cities. The whole tour was 10. I couldn't make all 10. And we were planning to do, you know, Sai, you know, Sai Penamunu was planning to do uh-huh. 12 cities this year. Oh and my God. I, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to go on all 12. Right. And then, right. you know, 2020 <laughs> happened. That's right. You mentioned something a little bit earlier. I also wanted to follow up on. It's very, uh-huh. very important for people. And I'm glad you mentioned it is this you know, you feel good when you've accomplished something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like you turn <clears> the <throat> cameras and the audio and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's basically having a builder's mindset. You're building something. I used to be in the construction business, you know, we, oh. um, you know so I've, I'm a developer from that you know, perspective. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. the term we use as a developer. Yeah. yeah. The DNA. It's in your yeah. DNA. To do <laughs> Absolutely. And right. I, I've worked at uh, research facilities with, uh, you know, scientists and physicians and uh, veterinarians uh, and I've worked in high tech with engineers. They're mm-hmm. very similar mindset in the sense of building. They right. have a construction mentality. You know, mm-hmm. um, they're sitting behind a keyboard writing code that is mm-hmm. intended to construct something, to you know, True. build something. That's what build something new. You know, developers. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I find when I do that, I mean, you seem to be reflecting that when I do that, I can lose myself in that. And then I feel a lot better than, you know, than not actually being able to just be at the whim of, just be at the whim of things. And all these developers that we are interacting with feel in a, you know, similar way, essentially. The ability to build Mm -hmm. something, Mm -hmm. to take yourself out of the circumstance and go into the keyboard, into the tool um, Mm -hmm. and actually, actually, you know, build something new. So it's just, it's a, it's a mindset. It's a mindset. I think that's Mm -hmm. very, very important for people to realize. And I was just, I was happy that you were sort of reflecting that basically saying that that's what you experienced as well. Mm -hmm. It is because um, it's, um, it's giving us that indication that, I'm making some progress. I'm doing something. I'm achieving something. And without that, life tends to become meaningless. I go back to this uh, beautiful book that I referred to earlier, Man's Search for Meaning uh, from Dr. Viktor Frankl. And he espoused a whole theory about um, psychotherapy, which is called logotherapy. And logos in Greek means uh, uh, purpose right? Having a sense of meaning. So his entire focus was when you find a sense of meaning and purpose, everything else sort of fades into the background. And he said during the two years or plus that he spent in the, in the prison camp, the Nazi prison camp, his purpose was he had his wife's photograph with him in his wallet and he would look at every now and then at his wife's photograph and he would visualize in his mind meeting her again or, you know, leaving the camp. And that's exactly what happened when the allied forces arrived. And, uh, but that, thought in itself was powerful enough to carry him through through some of the most gruesome things that were happening around him. So human life, when we get a sense of purpose, when we get a vision, I think that's also really important, Jim. Apart from this regular improvements, the builder's mindset, really, really powerful. That's execution. It's to bring that vision to reality. But also what's very important is to have something to look forward to. Very important. And we overlook it. We get so caught up in the to-do list and what's happening, the flow of things as they're coming to us, that we forget where do I really want to go. So please spend time uh, taking care of that. I keep a diary, which is my sort of, I call it the manifestation diary. And uh, what I do is every now and then I spend time writing about every aspect of my life into this. How would I like my finances to be? Okay, it's 2020. This should have been a different coronavirus special edition. (laughs) But I, I pick every aspect of my life, you know, my morning routine, my exercise, my fitness and things like that, that I would like to accomplish this year, which I haven't done before. How would I want my relationships, my career, Career, my clients, et cetera, et cetera. And then I write the ideal scenario, right? And then every now and then when I sort of life tends to feel meaningless or I'm feeling low and yes, motivational speakers can feel low as well. We are as human as, as everybody else. Uh, but what's important is that you have a mechanism to pull yourself out of it. And this serves as that mechanism, this sort of, what do I really want? I talked about it in the keynote at Sangam as well. This is a regular habit. I do it every now and then, put on my favorite piece of music and visualize all these things happening in my life. And that gives my mind a mental image to look forward to. Without this, life begins to feel empty. You know, it's like, okay, I don't know where I'm heading. My circumstances control me and that is incorrect. Your circumstances do not control you. You're not a victim. You're a co-creator. You're the co-author of your own journey. So take charge, take charge and figure out a direction. And every now and then look at it and see what progress you've made. So that sort of uh, helps you keep yourself on track. Okay, well, Simraji, thank you very much for talking with me today. Um, I occasionally flip through the Gita and I always think of you when I take my own, actually when I take my Gita and I flip through it. And uh, um, so I, it, was, it was really great to meet you last year likewise Tim. and mm-hmm. um hopefully uh, in the future we can meet again um live actually live yeah yeah, yeah. And, mm-hmm. but until then we'll do this and um thanks a lot for your advice and i hope people have um enjoyed it as much as i have Thank you so much, Jim, for having me. It means a lot to be on this uh, podcast today and to be sharing these views with you once again thank you really thanks a lot cool we'll talk to you soon bye-bye now bye take care